Welcome to the webcast, What's in a Name? Memory Semantics and Data Movement with CXL and SDXI, presented to you by SNEA. Today's presenters, so I am your humble host, David McIntyre. I am one of the leads at SNEA, and I am also a director of product planning and business development at Samsung. But most importantly, I have two distinguished speakers that will be walking you through this content today. The first is Sham Iyer, who is the chair of SNEA SDXI Technical Working Group. He is also part of the SNEA Technical Council, and he is a distinguished engineer at Dell. And then uh, also we have Rita Gupta, who is a CXL Consortium contributor and member. She is also part of the Memory System Systems Work Group and also the CXL System Architect with AMD. So this is really exciting. These are two notable experts that will walk us through the content. But first, let me take a moment and tell you a little bit about SNEA. So we represent 180 industry-leading organizations with 2,500 active contributing members, and we serve over 50,000 IT end users and storage pros worldwide. We cover a number of topics, anything from interfaces, standardization, applications, programming frameworks, you name it. If it's storage and networking and even now compute with computational storage, we cover it. Uh, and so please take a look at SNEA. I'm sure that if that's your vocation in compute storage and networking, we have things to help you and serve you. Uh, the content today, actually it's a really good deal because you can take this content and use it as you'd like to enhance your own uh, works, uh, but we just ask that you don't modify it. That's the only uh, request and there's no warranties express or implied with this content. So use it at your own risk. Uh, and in fact, you will be able to download this contact uh, from the attachment on your console at the end of the presentation. So today's agenda, first we'll talk about what SDXI and CXL are, and then we will dive right into heterogeneous compute and da data movement needs with CXL, and then close with SDXI and CXL, the path ahead. And we will also leave some time to address the questions that you have to our distinguished panel. So with that, let me please uh, pass the baton over to Sham Iyer from Dell, who will uh, introduce us to SDXI. Thank you, David. Uh, so I'm here, I'm from Dell, but I also represent the SDXI Technical Working Group at SNEA. So I will talk to you about the SDXI topics. Uh, in the SDXI topics, uh, we're gonna cover the current uh, system architecture and the needs for a memory-to-memory -memory data movement standard. Uh, we will cover some of the use cases that SDXI uh, proposes to solve uh, with the help of a memory-to-memory -memory data mover. And then I'll talk to you about what the technical working groups uh, uh, in SNEA for SDXI has been working on and, uh, uh, and with a, an exciting announcement coming out of the technical working group um, before we get into CXL introduction. So, if you look at the current system architecture today, then most of the, the needs of a system start from an application. The application has uh, compute needs, and the compute is typically a CPU. And whenever a computation is performed, the data is uh, stored in memory, and this is the, the most uh, commonly used data that is in use. Uh, and they share a relationship of currency to boost performance. Uh, when the application needs to scale, it adds more threads to it, uh, translates to more cores on a CPU. Uh, whenever the data that is being computed on needs to be stored or transported elsewhere, an I.O. device is employed. Uh, this I.O. device is today usually non-current uh, and with the memory. And whenever data needs to be stored or transported out of the memory, the compute instructs by a DMA instruction, the IO device to be able to perform the data access from memory. 
And to boost performance, we generally optimize the I.O. memory path for latency and bandwidth reasons. And this has been a system architecture that has worked pretty well. But off late, we're seeing increased needs for application, which means that uh, typical compute uh, uh, architectures are evolving. Uh, we have CPUs, we have GPUs, we have ASSPs like drives and NICs, and FPGA is all trying to uh, help boost replication performance. They also have lots of memory types that they can now work with uh, for the various uh, application needs. And further, uh, with links and fabrics like CXL, we can now connect them all together. And that means the, the, the memory types are truly democratized with these type of links and fabrics, and the application can make use of all of them. But they also have the same design constraints uh, in terms of how the application needs, uh, whether it's latency, bandwidth, or currency control. What is our current data movement standard today? So if you take a look at it, it's usually a software-based memory copy. And it is a standard today for a good reason, because it uh, uses a stable instruction set. The instruction set architecture uh, uh, has been there for a while, and therefore applications can, uh, can work on that. But it also takes away from the application performance, because now the compute is being used to perform the data copies. There are also multiple layers of software that need to be provided to just provide context isolation, like say, between two virtual machines or two different containers. It's not like DMA engines or offload DMA engines are a new concept. The problem is they're all vendor specific and there is no standardized uh, access for user level software with the help of these uh, DMA engines. What are the use cases that can benefit with an architected accelerated data mover? If you look at one of the examples, and this is the, I'm going to go through three examples, but they're just representational, and you can come up with more. This is an example of an application trying to perform a memory copy from one buffer to another buffer. And typically that's performed using a software-based memory copy, but this takes away from the application performance like we discussed. We can accelerate this with the help of an accelerator by allowing an application to instruct a work item in the form of a descriptor, uh, and then telling the accelerator to go pick it up using a doorbell. The accelerator can perform the data copy while the application is free doing other things. And once the copy is performed, it can signal the application that it's done. All these while the application could be doing other useful things. So this is how we have offloaded the memory copy. Another pattern that you can employ is when you're trying to store data into storage or retrieve them. If you take a look at how that's done today, you will see that lots of memory buffer copies happen. An application uh, needs to uh, uh, do the copy from the user buffer to a kernel buffer, and then somehow a kernel mode driver is instructed to pick it up, pick up the data. This driver may perform another memory copy to a DMable memory region, and then the storage is instructed to, to fetch the data, and that becomes a DMA read. And when you're trying to do a, a retrieval of the data, the same set of steps happen in reverse, and you can see more memory copies happening. These copies are costly. That's for, uh, you can optimize them. One way to optimize them is with the help of uh, a persistent memory uh, region in your memory architecture. So which means that in the same address space, you can have both volatile or DRAM address spaces and persistent memory address spaces. And because they are memory, there can be memory pointers to them and you can perform software-based memory copies between them. But still, you're going to take away from the application performance. So this has eliminated some of the copies. Now we can further optimize them with the help of an accelerator, which can now also target those same memory address spaces and perform them in such a way that they are offloaded. A third use case would be if you had uh, two virtual machines uh, and they want to perform data movement to each other's address spaces. What would you do today? Today, typically, you would perform a memory copy into a kernel buffer, uh, and the kernel may, may decide to use an I.O. device to do a DMA read. This goes potentially through a network, and another I.O. device or the same device does a DMA write to another kernel buffer. And then, finally, a memory copy is done into the second virtual machine's user buffer. 
This can be optimized with the help of an accelerator that uh, can safely and securely read the data buffer from one guest virtual machine, spin it around, and then write that data buffer into a second virtual machine. Now, this is the best of both worlds where we have the context isolation layer preserved as well as optimized buffer copies. We also see that the current data in use memory is getting expanded, like we talked about with DRAM, persistent memory, CXL attached memory, and MMIO spaces. Add in an accelerator, and now you see the need for one, memory expansion targets more address spaces. We have different tiers of memory that uh, need data movement. And because you have different accelerator programming methods, we need standardization. What else can we do here? What kind of stack should we build for an accelerator like this? So if you split that into a data plane and control plane, an accelerator can be uh, uh, you know, instantiated and initialized, uh, and you can discover its capabilities from the control plane with the help of a kernel mode driver. Uh, you can enable a kernel mode application to directly access the accelerator interface uh, from the data plane inter uh, interface. But you can also enable a new set of applications with the help of a user mode library that enables uh, uh, user mode applications to directly access the accelerator interface. So with the separation of control plane and data plane, now you have uh, a variety of applications that can directly access the accelerator. Enter STXI. So STXI stands for a smart data accelerator interface. It's a proposed standard for a memory to memory data movement uh, interface that is one extensible, forward compatible, and independent of the IO interconnect technology. Uh, it was formed in June 2020 and tasked to work on this standard in SNIA. We have 28 member companies and 80 plus individual members, and the membership continues to grow. At a grand level, this is the vision that it is working towards. An STXI uh, interface implemented uh, implementation can exist on different form factors. It could be implemented on a CPU or as integrated in an integrated manner or in discrete chips like GPUs or FPGAs or smart IO devices. It is designed such that it can eliminate all of the software context isolation layers uh, that impede performance, but and also enable a direct user mode app access for the applications. But it does it in such a way that it preserves the security and architectural stability of software-based mem copies. It is also designed to be able to target different types of memory types. Uh, and while doing this, we have tried to make sure that data movement can happen between different address spaces, whether they are in virtual machines and user spaces uh, uh, or in kernel spaces. The data movement is also uh, can happen without mediation by the privileged software once the connection has been established. And the layering is such that you can now abstract and virtualize with the help of privileged software. For virtual machine migration to, to be possible, uh, you need a capability to quiesce, suspend, and resume the architectural state of this address space data mover. SDXI is trying to solve that. Also, forwards and backward compatibility so we can have future versions of the specification. By by having a spec that is architectural in nature, we can now build additional offloads leveraging the same interface. So in short, the SDXI scope can be used with multiple use cases. Here's a picture of how it can be implemented. And this is just representational. Uh, but you can think about this as an SDXI function, which has a set of MMIO registers. Uh, and it, it has a set of memory structures that the spec standardizes. Uh, context is, is the environment in which a producer will operate to enqueue work like memory data movement. And all of these structures are in state memory. This is a busy slide. I'm not going to explain all of it. But rest assured that you know for data movement to happen, at least you need one or two buffers. And whenever you want to perform uh, the work, you need head or tail pointers or read index and write indexes. Whenever the operation gets done, you need a completion status. SDXI standardizes all of that. Something else that it also standardizes is what address spaces that it is allowed to perform data movement to, and that's specified by the A key table. And what address spaces that you can allow data access from, and that's specified with the R key table, and a standardized way to log errors. 
they, this is a layered model in which you have the level applications can access and also a layer in which the the uh, the privileged software can control and for pci based implementations we have gone ahead and registered a class code uh, for this so that common drivers that use the same uh, stxi class code can be implemented this is another example of a multi-address space data movement uh, usage model. Uh, this is an extreme case, but it shows you the power of how SDXI can be used to perform address space to address space data movement. In this example, I have an address space B, which has a producer in it. And this address space uh, is trying to perform data movement from address space A to address space C. It has an A key table that specifies the address spaces that it is allowed to access. And as you can see, it, it uses, uh, it can uh, allow access to address space A and address space C. So when the producer needs to perform a data movement operation, it enqueues a work into the descriptor ring. Uh, and then uh, after the function reads the descriptor, it uh, figures out that the data mover operation is from A to C. Uh, it checks whether it is allowed to access that. Once that check passes, it goes ahead and uh, reaches into address space A, and at this place, uh, the receiver is checked to make sure that uh, it is allowed to access the data buffers from address space A. Once this check passes on both address space A and address space C, now you're able to perform a DMA read from address space A, turn it around, and do a DMA write into address space C. Simple. So this is a secure way of performing this data movement operation between multiple address spaces. We have a lot of contributors that have contributed to the spec as of date. As you can see from this picture, we have the length and breadth of the industry from CPU vendors to OS vendors to OEMs to chip vendors and memory vendors. And they've all contributed in, in many ways to make the standard uh, a lot more sound. And I'm pleased to announce that as of Monday, we just released version 1.0. This is now available for you to download and implement. And the, let the begin implementations begin on version 1.0. This has been a great effort spanning across the industry, across multiple companies, and I couldn't have been more pleased to announce it at this forum. What can you expect us to do more? Post 1.0 activities. Again, these are all the post 1.2 activities are draft. They're not yet. You can expect us to perform uh, work on uh, new data mover operations that involve acceleration, maybe something that involves data transformation while you are moving the data. It can also involve operations targeting specifically persistent memory targets. It can also in, in, include uh, building cash currency models or optimizing for currency when you use a data mover. It can also in include uh, security features when you involve data movers. It's something else that we are thinking about is how can we set up the connection between multiple address spaces before we ask them to perform the data movement. That would be done using the connection manager. Some additional topics that we are thinking about is how can we improve QoS latency, uh, RAS, and you know, how can we be better on a CXL environment uh, like this discussion today. And how, how does SDXI fit into a heterogeneous environment? Because remember, it is architecture independent, implementation independent, and interconnect independent. With that, I would like to introduce Rita Gupta from AMD to go over the CXL introduction topics. Rita? Thank you, Sham. That was a great introduction to SDXI. So let's start talking about CXL. What we are going to discuss in this introduction and overview is um, update from the CXL consortium. Uh, we'll provide overview of the CXL protocol as such, and then talk about how the features have been evolving across the generations of CXL specification. We'll touch on the CXL usage models and also discuss that how does that translate into the data movement and how the compute systems with heterogeneous compute and data movement is becoming more and more critical. So uh, introducing the CXL consortium, as you can see, the, 
the industries who is in who are participating in the CXL consortium it's an industry open standard for high speed communication it, and what what you see is uh, is a wide and uh, very active engagement across multiple companies there are about 225 member companies as of today on CXL consortium and the list list is growing by the day and from the inception uh, one of the things that is emerging is uh, is CXL is becoming the industry focal point for coherent IO standards. There have been other standards in the space in in past, and of course there have been proprietary uh, proprietary implementations as well. Uh, but as uh, CXL is introduced into the industry as an open standard, all of these are aligning together to formulate or go behind this one strategy, one approach, and also shaping it together. So. Um, Recently, uh, if you have seen the announcement, OpenCAPI and Gen Z also joined the forces with CXL to fold their um, assets into the CXL consortium and uh, agree to work together to form this uh, standard, take the standard forward. Let's talk about the CXL features and benefits. Uh, how was CXL actually? Incept, uh, was conceived. So if you look at the compute industry landscape, some of the trends are uh, very peculiar over the last few years. There is always increasing demand for data processing and compute uh, as we are looking at the generation over generation data center architectures. This increasing demand also translates into having a need for heterogeneous computing, uh, which means that you can have different types of memories, different types of devices connected together and performing together. And all of that means is you need more and more memory capacity and bandwidth. And um, as we discussed, there have been multiple standards uh, which tried to solve the IO interconnect but uh, there was lack of one open standard which was uh, which would look at this problem more comprehensively and enter CXL. What CXL is, is a cache coherent interconnect standard for processors, which provides a coherent interf uh, interface to the devices. Um, it's a, it leverages the PCIe infrastructure and it's a mix and match of three protocols, CXL.io, CXL.cache and CXL.memory. It's a low, low latency standard. So if you look at the CXL.memory and CXL.cache accesses, they're targeted to somewhere be near the near CPU latencies that you may see in the processor uh, systems. It also provides the asymmetric complexity so that uh, the device coherency, uh, device implementations are eased from the burden of maintaining the coherency. The coherency is managed on the host side. So that provides ease of implementation. So let's dive into what CXL is. Uh, we talked about it's a low latency and cache coherent interconnect. So it has a flexible processor port, which can be either used as a PCIe or as a CXL protocol. And that negotiation happens as the device uh, is enumerated and as the link training happens so, uh, through the alternate uh, protocol negotiation. It reuses all of the PCIe file infrastructure, which means that all the channel, pre-timers, file logicals, and uh, the link uh, and the protocols are reused between the PCIe and CXL. And it does the dynamic multiplexing of the three protocols, CXL.io, CXL.cache, and CXL.mem. So CXL.io is mainly the PCIe-based protocol, which is used for initialization um, or DMA and uh, any kind of memory mapped IO operations. It's mandatory for CXL devices to implement CXL.IO protocol. The devices can alternatively implement CXL.cache protocol, which is for uh, connecting the processor's memory uh, and having device access it. The device uh, in this case is going to provide the coherent accesses to the, uh, uh, the device cache. The CXL.mem protocol enables the memory accesses to the uh, to the, C the device attached memory from the processor. These are coherent accesses and uh, enables the host to have the memory expansion. With the mix and match of these protocols, we can look at some of the representative representative CXL usages. So, if you look at the CXL type one device, as we call it, it uses the CXL.io protocol and CXL.cache protocol. These devices are going to be uh, used for the, C uh, the caching accelerator. So these devices don't have the memory 
of its own um, being accessible to the host, but it rather uh, exposes the, uh, the it uses the coherent access to the host memory. And this could be some things like smart mix and uh, accelerators. The type two devices are um, are built with CXL.io, CXL.cache, and CXL.mem, all of these protocols. They have the memory available to the host to access and uh, which is coherent with the system memory. And also they are able to access the host memory. So these, if you look at the usages of this kind of model, uh, you could imagine the GPGPUs and dense computation of our FPJ accelerators building such functionality. And the third one is a type three device with the CXL.io and CXL.mem uh, interface implemented. So these are, this can be viewed as the CXL memory buffers. So these are where uh, you can have the device, have it so memory managed by the host uh, by a and have a coherent memory semantic provided to the device accesses. So this provides a media agnostic CXL interface uh, and uh, have the ability to expand the processor memory, either as a storage class memory or as a DRAM memory, whichever way, it's a media agnostic interface. Looking at how the CXL spec has been evolving over generations. So we started in 2019 with, uh, with 32 GTS speed, which is the PCIe Gen 5 with six, uh, 68 byte splits and introduce the concept of the three types of devices. The intention of the CXL 1.1 or the focus of CXL 1.1 is a point-to-point -point attach, and that's, that's the feature set it started with. As we moved on to CXL 2.0, uh, the feature set has been expanded to, uh, first of all, focus on fan out, uh, hence the concept of switching is introduced, um, and uh, persistent memory is introduced, and the memory pooling is introduced. We'll talk more about it as we talk about usage models. And um, when we get to CXL 3.0, that's the next generation, the focus is on scalability. So if you, uh, uh, apart from the fan out, so uh, the features that are introduced in CXL 2.0 are about how, how do we enhance the memory sharing? How do we enhance the scalability of the system with multi-level switching, uh, multiple type two devices, type one devices under the same root port and also the fabric capabilities. So if you look at the progression of the CXL spec, it is uh, it is not just looking at the problems of the compute industry that are uh, that we are facing today, but it is looking at the problems that that are for the future as well and uh, solving them in in time. Talking about the use cases on the CXL front, uh, so. We have uh, the first and foremost, what we can look at is the CXL memory expansion use case. Here, if you look at it, the CXL expander memory is connected to the host and it can, it can have some media behind it. It helps processor to add capacity and bandwidth to the system. And since this is a media agnostic interface, you could have a lower cost memory behind it and uh, help improve the TCO of the system. The, expanded or rather extended use of this is if you are using the tiered memory expansion. In this case, the, the applications and the system is well aware of the different characteristics of the media here and can use uh, the tiering mechanism to maintain the data in the hot memory, hot data into the memory which is faster and move the data which is cold to the slower memory tier, which can be behind CXL. And this is where the data movement becomes extremely critical. With this method, or uh, with this usage model, we can definitely add capacity to the system and also add effective bandwidth to the system. And, and in turn, uh, lower the DCO of the system because you could now uh, be adding this capacity and bandwidth at lower cost than you would have if you just extended the system memory address space. The interesting usage model that got enabled with the CXL 2.0 and 3.0 are the shared memory and the pooled memory concept. If you look at the diagram here, what you see is the memory behind one device is actually being used by multiple hosts. Uh, if the allocation is done uh, across the two different hosts, the pooled memory use cases when the memory is allocated to one particular host at given time and is being accessed. In case of memory sharing, which is enabled with CXL 3.0 specification, it actually one one memory location could be accessed by multiple hosts, and the coherency is managed uh, via the CXL protocol and the device backend validate channels. 
uh, that uh, these usage models are intended to reduce the memory stranding because now you if you look at the memory resources which are very expensive they are being effectively utilized across the different systems and hence this resource disaggregation helps uh, improve the data usage efficiency and also uh, lowers the TCO for the system. With CXL switch, we can increase uh, the device fan out. You can either connect different types of devices behind a switch and in uh, increase the system fan out of this memory. Alternatively, you can also have uh, what we call as the multi-logic device behind a switch. Multi-logic device is, uh, is a construct to enable the memory pooling. If you look at those multi-logic devices, they can have a single device can emulate uh, having a function of multiple devices inside it and enable the pooling operation uh, with the switch. And uh, the memory can be pulled across different hosts as indicated by the colors in, in this uh, striped memory region that each host is using a different uh, set of memory. So uh, looking back at use cases, you could uh, see the obvious needs of data movements when we are looking at the tiered memory architectures. As, as we move forward into the heterogeneous computing, the data movement becomes more and more important. What CXL enables is a very fluid and flexible memory model. What we have is all of these different memory spaces, be it a different type of media, be it a different class of memory, and uh, different devices such as memory expanders, accelerators, all of them are now part of the single common memory address space across the different processors and devices. Uh, this means that the data movement across these different devices and the processor is more and more crucial to keep it most efficient. Uh, it is important that we can, uh, we can make sure that the accesses to these memory are low latency and high performance. And this is where uh, we are talking about how do we make the data moment more efficient. All right. Let me, let me tie this together. And in, you know, in a world where you have STXI and CXL, how can you envision or imagine an architecture? On the left here is a, a picture of an application that wants to perform data movement from one region of CPU attached memory to another region of CPU attached memory. And let's for, an, uh, for a moment assume or implement an STXI uh, device, which is based on a PCIe based implementation. So in this model, you would specify a work item, ring a doorbell, the STXI PCIe device will will do the data read from one region of the CPU attached memory and do a DMA write into another region of the CPU attached memory. What does CXL provide? CXL, as Rita explained, allows you to add CXL memory address spaces in and make them part of the single unified memory address space that is now available to the CPU, as well as to PCIe STXI implementations like an STXI device. So now you can perform a memory to memory data movement from one region of the CPU attached memory to another region of the CXL attached memory uh, uh, that's uh, whether shared or pooled. So that's a fabulous extension uh, of a great win-win situation where now you can have an architected data mover being able to access different tiers of memory, whether they are CXL attached or device attached. A second kind of thing that you can imagine here is a, an implementation where the X, STXI device is an actual CXL device implementation. And in this example, it can have a, a memory which is attached to the CXL device. Um, and for an application that wants to perform peered memory uh, data movement between CPU attached memory and device attached memory, this STXI CXL device implementation can again be used to perform those memory address space to a memory address space data movement. So as you can see, we've got a win-win situation here. A memory-to-memory -memory data mover can now live in a CXL-enabled unified memory address space and optimize your performance needs uh, quite significantly. Thank you, Sham. So what we saw, uh, saw before in this presentation is memory tiering and memory borrowing with heterogeneous memory and in general, the need to build a composable system with different uh, set of CPUs, APUs, and uh, accelerators, memories together. 
highlight the need of having an efficient data movement. What we enable with CXL is having an interconnect, which is low latency, high bandwidth fabric, which is, which is a very good tool for creating this efficient data movement across these different components of the system. So STXI enables a standard application interface. Uh, why is that important? Because now you can have applications using the same standard interface to perform the data movement. What does CXL provide, which we highlighted, is the low latency and the high bandwidth fabric. Uh, and to tie them together, now you can use C STXI standardized interfaces in, an S in a CXL environment to, to boost uh, uh, one memory capacity, as well as perform tiered memory for more intelligent. So the community call to action that we have here is, let's align and drive a, an STXI standardized data movement uh, in a CXL enabled system architecture. And with that, I would like to hand it to David uh, to see if we have questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Sean and Rita for a wonderful presentation. Um, so that, yeah, let's, let's get into the Q and A and respond back to um, our illustrious audience on some pertinent questions that they may have. Um, you know, Sean, you mentioned SDXI is interconnect agnostic. And yet we're talking about SDXI and a specific interconnect here, right? Which is CXL. So is, is SDXI architected to, to really work on CXL? <laughs> so yes, it's a sort of a, we, we, went, we, we put that one, right? So I think SDXI is certainly designed to be interconnect agnostic, which means that you know you could you could have an SDXI implementation uh, which which uses the PCIe as the interconnect, but we can also use the CXL as the interconnect. Someone may be able to implement SDXI on an interconnect that is uh, not standardized as well. What SDXI is trying to do is it's standardizing the memory structures, function setup, the control. Uh, ensure that when you say it's an STXI device, you can reliably start a data movement operation, uh, reliably stop it, know exactly what the status of the data mover is whenever you want to stop it, so that now you can perform uh, you know, things like uh, application migration, or EM migration, things like that. So it does not preclude an implementation from taking advantage of the interconnect uh, uh, that provides it. So a DMA bus that has more features like uh, uh, based on CXL interconnect, uh, you can make use of that. And that's why that's why I think CXL and STXI can be great buddies. Uh, it's uh, while we would want and it to be implementation and interconnect agnostic, there can be specific bindings. For instance, for a PCIe based implementation, we did go ahead and register a class code for STXI. And that reason is that now you can have a class code driver that is common for the entire operating system. And you won't have to have multiple drivers to uh, talk with as, uh, different types of SDXI implementations. Okay, well, that's a mouthful, and um, but that, that helps uh, us understand a little bit between the, the interaction between SDXI and CXL better. So thank you for that. Let's see, so let me think. Um, Oh, I have a question kind of more fundamental, I suppose. Maybe Rita, you could jump in on this. So um, memory pooling and memory sharing, um, you know, those are becoming agnostic or buzzwords, whatever you'd like to call them in, in the industry these days. What what are they? What what are the advantages of either one? Yeah, that's a great question. So memory pooling, as we were looking at the usage model front, is when you actually have set of memory behind a device pulled across different hosts or different nodes. Um, and memory sharing is, and when I say pooled, it is it means that it is allocated to a given host at a time. And this is, of course, a dynamic allocation. You can go back and forth, allocate memory to one host, and then uh, bring it back to the device and bring uh, allocate to another host. So there is a dynamic allocation with memory pooling. What memory sharing enables is, is slightly more uh, 
nuance than that. It has uh, the same memory location can be accessed by multiple hosts at, at a given time. So both of them are about, uh, there are some common advantages, of course. Both of them are about utilizing the resources efficiently. Memory in general in today's data center is one of the most expensive resources. It is, uh, if you look at any data center, bill of material memory is perhaps the biggest contributor or a very big chunk of the spending. So what uh, what folks would want to do is make sure that those resources are being utilized to the maximum and also utilized more efficiently. So if you look at the traditional system where there is a memory populated on the system and then the, you, you have course are associated with that system, it is a very fixed configuration. There is not much flexibility available to move around memory if one particular host does not need it anymore or cannot use it, all of it. So with memory pooling and memory sharing, what we enable is keeping that resources flexible and fungible from one system to another, one host to another. If the host needs it, it allocates it on the go. You're not tied to a particular configuration to begin with. And um, as you go, um, as you go on running the system, running the VMs, if you need more memory, you can always get it from the pool or the shared shared resources. That is the concept of resource disaggregation. It's a, and it's a huge, uh, huge opportunity to reduce the total cost of operation here. Great, thank you, Rita. Well, I hope neither one of you are planning a second breakfast because we have a full pipeline of questions for you today. So uh, the next question, will SDXI impact or change or unify NVMe? So uh, that's a jump ball. Either one of you can take that question or both. Sure. Uh, so I don't think about SDXI as replacing NVMe or you know trying to compete with NVMe. I think the the way the even when you are when you are implementing NVMe, there are various memory data movement needs uh, in a system architecture. So there, in some ways, we are just creating a new class of device and a new class class of uh, uh, data mover uh, that has very different needs than. Uh, uh, traditional NVMe uh, uh, implementations. That said, an, an SDX side device can absolutely complement an NVMe uh, system design uh, for uh, data movement needs. In fact, uh, we have a subgroup in SNIA uh, that is made of computational storage Twig members and uh, SDX side Twig members working on what are the ways where SDXI complements uh, storage uh, implementations, uh, which includes uh, uh, devices uh, th that implement NVMe? Well, super. Uh, Rita, do you have any comment on that, on SDXI and the impact on NVMe? I think Sham covered it very well, and um, that addresses most of it. Yep. OK, super. Well, um, let's move on to, to, so first of all, um, the SDXI spec 1.0 is out. So congratulations to everybody involved in that spec uh, uh, from SNEA and for the industry in uh, looking to, to review that spec and, and put it to good use. So congratulations to that. So uh, now that it's out, um, what sort of implementations can we start with SDXI? And maybe put the, the, you know, what is the context of the spec for implementations as a reference or, you know, help, help us out on that. Yeah, no, so this is good because um, I think this, the timing of this uh, presentation couldn't have been more apt. Um, and, uh, you know, 1.0 is out now. And that means that it's now a SNEA standard. Uh, and so uh, implementations uh, can begin. Uh, in fact, a lot of the implementations are already in flight that I won't talk about it today, but a 1.0 uh, implementation now is available for anyone to build on. Uh, and if, you, if you're looking to sort of influence a future version of the specification, uh, then now's the right time to come and uh, join the STXI twig in SNEA. Uh, we are in the planning, planning process for post 1.0 features but from the point of view of what version 1.0 is, it now enables a, a memory to memory data mover 
implementation uh, uh, and uh, depending on what form factor you are implementing it, whether in the CPU or integrated or a discrete form factor, uh, uh, the, this spec should be good for you to, to get to the, to the structures that are required to be standardized, the implementation, how it needs to adhere to the structures. And uh, uh, I would welcome uh, all of you looking to implement this to start looking at this pretty seriously. Okay, um, so here's, thank you for that, Sean. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to putting these specs to good use and, and uh, in, in applications for sure. Uh, maybe a question for Rita. So uh, software development is being throttled by the availability of standard CXL host platforms. So when do you think CXL platforms will start coming out? Um yeah, CXL ecosystem is in general evolving very rapidly. This is one of the most dynamic landscape. Uh, we have uh, multiple host platforms publicly announced or coming soon uh, for development. These are CXL 1.1 based, but uh, the next versions would be uh, coming out in future soon. And uh, from the device front, there have been multiple vendors, or uh, if you look at the consortium member list, multiple members have been developing their own products. Some of them are starting to get available. So the ecosystem is evolving very rapidly and dynamically. So watch out for that. And uh, the, this is a space uh, which would definitely see a lot of movement. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so the next question, you know, we are seeing that CXO, um, can can is an environment that in some ways can benefit from an SDXI standardized data mover. And uh, now we're going to go molecular. Is there a limitation on the granularity size of transfer? SDXI is limited to bulk transfers only, or does it also address small granular transfers as well? Yeah, the spec covers you to do from a single byte to four gigabytes of memory uh, transfers that you can specify. So it's not, uh, you know, it's byte level addressability. So there isn't, uh, you know, certain block sizes of data movement that you can do. Uh, so SDXI covers the gamut of memory operations that you can do. Now, to the question of what what should you do is based on the amortization you may be able to get in doing the actual data movement. In some cases, when the data is closer to the compute, and you, uh, you know, the setup time may be more than the actual uh, performing the data movement by, say, a CPU instruction. That's fine. When you want to asynchronously have make the data movement happen, the bulk data movement, uh, STXI becomes a really powerful tool for you to be able to perform that. Okay, so that's that's good. That's. Um... Uh, you know, a related question we got was, does a PCI Express based data mover with an SDXI interface actually DMA data across the PCI Express link? And if so, isn't that higher latency and less power efficient than a mem copy operation? Not really. Uh, it depends on, you know, so if you are prepared to uh, spend a lot of CPU cores to perform a, a large data movement copy operation, uh, then yes, uh, what what an STXI data mover offers you uh, is uh, is a, an off a threshold that you can arrive at based on an implementation that you choose. At what which threshold it becomes more easier to use an offload data mover. Uh, and uh, uh, in in fact, we have uh, some experimentation that has uh, specified that there are specific thresholds at which offloading is actually outweighing the benefits of performing software-based mem copies. So there have been papers about that. Uh, and so uh, I think it really depends on the implementation threshold. So what SDXI is trying to do is it's not specifying an implementation requirement. It is specifying the standardized structures in which this offload data mover uh, should be able to perform this type of data movement. The thresholds will depend on the actual implementation. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And now let's let's kind of come back from the the depths of these uh, the the questions that are at the bottom of the ocean all the way to the surface here. Um, you know how how are SNIA and CXL collaborating in general? Um, 
you know, how are we, how are the two organizations working together? Maybe I can take that uh, here. I think just like you see this webcast. Um, so there, there's a marketing uh, alliance agreement between SNIA and CXL. And, uh, you know, that allows us to talk about each other's technologies and be at a, a, a great uh, uh, collaboration that different specs are developing. And we find synergies by these kind of interactions. Uh, also, lots of members uh, are in both groups, in CXL as well as in SNIA. And that helps the flow of information and the collaboration going um, uh, before some of a formal uh, arrangement can happen. But I would say this is a great example of the two, two communities getting together and talking about something that is a, a really a win-win situation for both uh, communities. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Sham. Um, and just, you know, on back to SDXI, is there going to be a, some standard SDXI driver available from SNIA or, or, or through the companies, through your companies, through the ecosystem? Um, you know, where can we find driver support for SDXI and um, any compatible hardware that supports SDXI? Perfect. So let me address at least some part of the software uh, question. So with the uh, publishing of the 1.0 standard, we also uh, published the uh, sort of the header files that includes the structures that you need to implement uh, to write software. Uh, and uh, these were generated off the spec, so it's it's all uh, you know based on the spec uh, that the header files are. So an implementation using those header files can begin. There is more software activity that is being planned uh, that is currently within the twig right now. Uh, at this point, I would say that implementations are happening. Uh, on what form they will come out, uh, I will be able to talk more about it uh, in the coming few months. Okay. Well, thanks, Sham. Uh, Reed, a question for you. So, you know, CXL, it's it's talked about as low latency. Um, you know, what are some of the latency targets for CXL devices? Yep, absolutely. That's one thing that CXL highlights, that it's a lower latency protocol. So in general, for CXL-based devices, the intention is to uh, keep it the latency, uh, keep the latency somewhere close to the one Yuma hop latency. And let me describe that a little more. So the access to the direct attached CXL memory to a processor should look like the access to the remote socket memory that it would do uh, over the cross processor link. So uh, CXL specification does provide some guidance to the uh, to the device implementation about what those latencies should be from the when it is a specifically DRAM media. But of course, uh, it would vary across when there are different media types. And the CXL specification also provides a way to communicate their latency and bandwidth characteristics from the device to the applications uh, by uh, various tables and information around that. So uh, in general, the goal is to keep it as one Yuma hop, look and feel like a remote socket memory, um, and have more elaborate information available to the application for the characteristics of the device. So how about SDXI? Do you see you know, the data movement enablement of SDXI? Do you see that being deployed across CXL devices in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion? It can certainly be done in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Um, what what we can do with SDXI is as uh, the two parts that uh, we were describing in the slide earlier. That if it is a, it is from C uh, SDXI enabled device to another SDXI enabled device, it can uh, it can be done in a peer-to-peer -peer manner as well. Right. Yeah. I think the the key thing here is also you know how is the SDXI device implemented uh, if. If, if it is another CXL device, then it can perform peer-to-peer -peer between uh, different memories, uh, including uh, the one that may it may have uh, in the device space, uh, as well as if it's a PCIe-based device implementation, it has to do uh, the peer-to-peer -peer memory data transfer. So um, it will, and I think it 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 depends a little bit on the implementation of how STXI is implemented in the architecture, but certainly you can perform peer-to-peer -peer with the help of uh, an SDXI device implementation. 
Um, I have a question here on equivalent terms. So if you think of SDXI, um, the question is, can you think of SDXI as what NVMe is for NVMe OF? And CXL is the underlying transport fabric like TCP. I think they're, the question has to do with, with terms and semantics and how do you relate SDXI and CXL together? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't completely think about them like that. Um, so yes, STXI does have operations and opcodes kind of similar to what you can think about from an NVMe opcodes point of view uh, for the operations. Uh, but it, um, it's, it's also kind of like interconnect independent. And in this case, uh, whether PCIe or CXL, um, uh, uh, is is the interconnect is sort of at the uh, at that layer. Uh, you can also put transport protocol on top of uh, a data mover, and uh, you know you can do RDMA or TCP on top of uh, an SDXI data mover. So that becomes a an overlay protocol in that sense. So uh, I think the comparison is there a little bit of a slight, but it's not the exact same apples to apples. Okay, super. Well, with that, I think I'm going to officially close our Q&A session. So thank you, Sham and Rita, for excellent commentary across all these questions. Lots of great interest from the audience. So uh, let's move into after this webcast. Um, and this is uh, offered up to the audience. So please rate the webcast. It's really helpful for all the active volunteers to fine tune and provide you with the very best content from SNEA. So we welcome your feedback. Uh, the webcast and a copy of the slides are available at the SNEA Educational Library. And I believe also uh, with this Bright Talk presentation, you can look for the uh, attachment uh, button on the console, on your console. So another option for you. Um, we will publish out the Q&A that we just walked through, including any additional uh, answers to questions that we didn't get to today. And those will be posted on our blog at sneafblog.org. And also follow us on Twitter. Uh, always good to, to see the latest and greatest coming out of SNEA, of course. And with that, I'll uh, give you back to your calendars and thank you again, Sham and Rita, for your expertise on this, this subject matter today. And thank you all for uh, listening and participating actively in this webcast. Have a great day.